Good evening, Wisdom Eccentrics by Nat Chang Rinpoche, Chapter 37, Part 2. You know, there's another thing about Rinpoche's teaching environment that occurs to me, I said to Genevieve and Eduard. It's like a dertre, a charm ground. I think he's created an emotional, psychological charnel ground. I explained the idea of the charnel ground to them and they were most interested. In the East, Dertro are pretty frightening places, but not frightening in the spooky sense that's portrayed in movies. There was simply some kind of raw reality there. When you read descriptions of the eight great charnel grounds, they're horrific, but not ghoulish. There's no cold grey mist. They're extremely energetic, infested by lions and tigers, jackals and carrion crows. Vultures descend, grab lengths of intestine and fly into the air. Globs of gut drop from a height. There are groves resplendent with luxuriant trees, where Gaudi-esque parrots speak in tongues or squawk stridently. There's death there, but it's not stopped moving. Death in the West is a static affair, much in the style of a mortuary or graveyard. The bodies are inert. In the charnel ground, however, bodies wriggle with maggots. They convulse as they're torn apart. Wolves gnaw on stray limbs. Eyeballs fall from sockets and slither across the ground. The animals, however, are all alive and extremely healthy. They spring with vigour, snarling, growling, howling, or bellowing as it pleases them. This is a symbol for the way in which practitioners could approach the non-dual state, inasmuch as the charnel ground is chaotic. This is the orderly chaos of emptiness and form, where birth and death occur simultaneously. There are dead bodies, but maggots are eating them. Maggots are born in them, live in them, and die in them. It's not possible to understand whether we're seeing birth or death. So where do we find solid ground there? I asked. The ground's always changing. Right, Eduard commented. So from that perspective, Rinpoche has conjured a charnel ground for our practice. They both looked a little stunned, so I reassured them that this particular charnel ground, within the greater charnel ground of life itself, was temporary. And that's how you see this, Eduard asked. No, it's how I try to see it. If I really saw it that way, it would be a great accomplishment. I just have to continually remind myself that I'm living in a charnel ground. I see, that makes some kind of sense to me, Genevieve responded tentatively. But I am happy it is temporary. I don't think I could live like this for very long. Nor could I, I smiled, feeling somewhat contrite. But it's useful to remember the charnel ground when things get out of hand. I see it as living the view, recognising that the charnel ground is in itself the practice of accepting chaos. Chaos is any situation that's out of control. Does that mean one gives up any kind of control over anything? 
Genevieve asked. No, not exactly. We just have to accept that the situation is fundamentally out of control. We can, however, dance with the situation. Dancing means, asked Eduard. Dancing means being without hope of completely controlling anything. That doesn't mean that certain aspects of the practice cannot be modified, but only when the modification lies within our power. Sorry, that doesn't mean that certain aspects of the picture cannot be modified, but only when the modification lies within our power. Dancing just means that we cease to panic about what lies outside our power to modulate. We can change some aspects of what happens within the chaos because order can arise out of chaos. But order is form and form is emptiness. It seems then, Eduard commented, that every moment is chaos and that every moment can be seen as charnel ground. Yes, it's like that when people marry, have children and get divorced. This was on their minds because a couple in the Sangha had just gone through a painful divorce. The relationship's dead, but not static. It's dead, but it's still jerking and convulsing. It is being eaten by maggots, like a body, but the maggots are lawyers. If you have children, the relationship never quite dies. Children get married and we have to attend their weddings. We cannot break free of these ex-spouses. The charnel ground is full of ghosts who haunt us, just as we're haunted by the past. This is an extremely powerful kind of practice, Genevieve commented. I am grateful to Rinpoche for it but I am also grateful that it does not last too long. I concurred and we laughed. They told me that we'd be going to an extremely fancy restaurant together with Rinpoche on my last night staying with them. They said I was to come with them and told me that three other students would also be going. We hope they will behave themselves with decorum as you do. Maybe, as our friend the philosopher will also be there, they will be a little more calm and it will make a nice holiday from this charnel ground. That's certainly what I'd wish, if only for your sake, I replied, and bid them good night. The days passed relatively peacefully and Kitja kept her distance. She just glowered at me across the courtyard. Dave and the merry mercenary were always good humoured with me and so I was well contented. Eventually my last evening arrived and we set out for the illustrious restaurant. Rinpoche's students were reasonably well dressed and there was no sense of rancour amongst them. I was not with them however. They were with the philosopher and I was with Rinpoche in the back of Genevieve and Eduard's Mercedes-Benz. The line, O oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes-Benz, tickled my fancy, but I thought it an inappropriate jest. We appeared to be heading out into the country and after a while we began to climb into the hills. We finally approached what seemed to be a border post and I noticed the customs and immigration signs. You will need your passport now, Eduard said. It's always with me. Yeah, Rinpoche added with a chuckle. Always in satchel he is keeping this. The occupants of the philosopher's car were evidently having problems with immigration, 
and we soon found out why. Rinpoche's three students have no passports with them. They had no idea we were leaving Switzerland to go to a restaurant in France. I had no idea either. Rinpoche was asked what should be done. The philosopher volunteered to take them back to Geneva, but Rinpoche would not hear of it. They must always be carrying passport. This is law if you are not Swiss. Every foreigner must be carrying passport all times. They must be knowing this. They must not law-breaking. Rinpoche's students asked him what they should do. He shrugged and indicated that they'd have to go back to the house. They had brought no money, so they'd just have to walk. They couldn't expect the philosopher to miss the special meal merely to take them back. And there'd be no point in his trying to take them back and returning for the meal because the meal was booked for a specific time. They'd made the reservation with difficulty and had only been accommodated by special request as it was. The three students glowered at me as my passport was handed back by the immigration official. Merci, monsieur. À votre santé, I replied and the officer offered me a smile mixed with a slight wince in respect of my appalling French accent and my use of a drinking toast. The students eyed me with unmistakable resentment. Was it my fault that I carried my passport in my goddamn satchel? I said, I'm really sorry, you know, it's an easy mistake to make. Rinpoche interrupted me. No, you passport keeping, I passport keeping, everyone must be knowing this. That was the final world, word and the three, all in high dudgeon, began their lugubrious trudge, some 15 miles in a light drizzle. Genevieve and Eduard expressed regret for the departed. They were concerned for the plight of the three having to walk so far. But Rinpoche professed no sympathy. They all adult and must be knowing Swiss law for foreigners. I am knowing this. Chugyam is knowing this. They must also be knowing this. This was a peculiar situation and I was mighty glad that I was leaving the next morning. The three hikers would probably still be fast asleep by the time I got to the airport and so there'd be no ugly scene at which my role as one big diplomat would be required. If the truth were known, I was growing weary of being one big diplomat, but there always seemed to be some extremely good reason why being forthright seemed problematic. I had no desire to give offence, etc. Etc. Et Be that as it may, we alighted from our cars some short way into France and entered the restaurant. I've never seen the like before or since. This was a place that had probably never seen a fellow like me, or Chimmy Riggs in Rinpoche for that matter. I was aware of eyes observing us. But before long, disdain was replaced by smiles. We'd obviously been explained as visitors from the land of snows, and so all was well. <laughs>